Uh, my pleasure, and I'd like to thank you to invite me. In fact, uh, it is nice to be precise. It's nice to be back because I have been here before for this special seminar, and that is exactly 17 years ago, believe it or not. And uh, certainly 17 years uh, is enough of a time that maybe something new can be reported. Okay, now first question is, I'm from the University of Idaho, so first question is, where is Idaho? It's the first scientific question that I want to raise here. Well, that's easy to answer. That is Idaho. Okay, now you know where Idaho is. Uh, then the next question you may have in the back of your mind, what's, what's, uh, what's Idaho like? Now, you know, uh, 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 the Americans, they can only speak in superlatives. Yeah, Texas is the greatest state in the world. Uh, Alaska is the coolest state. And New York has the highest high rises. California has the most wildfires, you know, whatever. So then the question, what is the superlative that describes this little state, Idaho? Well, there is one. It is the most unknown state in the United States. <laughs> You know, quite of knowledge is the first knowledge which is the rare and valuable knowledge, namely, you know, what, what Idaho is. Okay, so uh, the thing is the following uh, nuclear physics, in, in this context, let me point out the following at the beginning of, of the 21st century. We go through a phase of 100 year celebrations because. The foundation, when you think about it, the, the, whole, the foundations of what we call modern physics, they were all created 100 years ago. Max Planckton in, in 1900 ago, uh, the uh, uh, Einstein's special uh, relativity in 1905, force atomic 13, uh, general relativity 1915, so that's exactly uh, 100 years. And then one day uh, later, also, we will have, celebrate, have to celebrate, actually, the 100th anniversary of quantum mechanics, as we understand it. That would be 1925, so we have to wait another 10 years for that. Uh, but uh, nuclear physics also, so again, I don't want to talk about this crappy model here. Uh, I uh, showed it only to contrast it to the model that ultimately uh, emerged in 1911 by Rutherford, and which was the beginning of nuclear physics. So nuclear physics is 104 years old. And in view of the anniversary, uh, it is appropriate uh, to, to give you at least of the historical development of nuclear physics, because only based upon that one can understand what the great advances are today. So in 1911, uh, it was finally predicted that there is a nuclear in uh, the center of, of the atom, which is here shown in, in light blue. And the, the example of a nucleus I show here, uh, the, the sample of a nucleus that I show is, is helium. I could have chosen uranium, uh, but uh, I couldn't make so many pluses here. So uh, I chose this one for efficiency. Furthermore, let me note, no need to note, this is absolutely not to scale. Here, this blue area is 100,000 times smaller than the whole pumpkin, uh, but uh, I didn't draw it to scale simply because otherwise you wouldn't see anything. Okay, then in the 1920s, this was the model of the nucleus, simply for the following reason. In, in terms of elementary particles, those days were simple, the only elementary particles, namely the electron and the proton, there was nothing else. And, and so they tried to do it with just those. So the, the life was still very simple. Uh, in the 1920s. That's over. In the meantime, we have several thousand elementary particles. Uh, but, but that is garbage. This model is garbage. So uh, finally, the right model emerged in 1932. That's an important number when the neutron was uh, discovered by Chadwick. And ever since, this is the proper picture of the atomic nucleus. And you may say, say now, OK, so since 1932, we know what the atomic nucleus is like. What do you have to say here? No, the point of fact, when, when it became clear what the structure of a, a nucleus is, then the problems came, uh, the problems started, as I will explain in a moment. And it were problems which were first perceived as naive 
something you can overcome soon, but it turned out that a, a series of never-ending uh, <clears throat> nightmarish problems started, and that I will explain in a moment. By the way, I just noticed a little side effect of my little overview with pictures is that uh, 80 years ago, nuclear physicists obviously dressed a little bit differently than we are used to today, particularly when I look at this audience and myself too, including myself. But uh, I think the physics has not suffered under that. In, in any case, since 1932, this is a picture of the nucleus. And so since 1932, and only then, it was clear there is a new force in nature. So before. Before that time, there was no, no concept of a strong force, a nuclear force, or whatever. Uh, because by electromagnetic forces, such a system could never hold together. Uh, so you need a force between pro, a, 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 an additional force to the electromagnetic one between protons, neutrons, and protons and neutrons. And uh, ever since, one of the most agonizing questions in modern physics is how to explain this new force. And uh, this, this search. Actually, that's also important historical fact that one cannot stress enough because it's, it's already. The, the search for the nature of the nuclear force, which started in the 1930s, uh, which was not very successful for many, many years, uh, had enormous spin-off for other, other fields, had enormous spin-off that was by no means anticipated. Namely, uh, it has been actually one of the most stimulating questions in the 20th century, and the brightest people in that century were involved in it. And uh, one big spin-off of the field is particle physics. Particle physics didn't exist before 1932, and the search for the nuclear force generated particle physics because it turned out you, you need subatomic particles to explain it. And in fact, in the early days, uh, uh, particle physics was also called nuclear physics. But then it took off and became actually a much, much big, bigger field. I mean, what happened to nuclear physics relative to particle physics is what you nowadays see when you walk through the street and you, to, to see two little parents with their, with their big bully teenage children. Yeah, so they have generated them. But then they became big bullies. And, and so nuclear physics then. In, in the 60s and 70s has been bullied around by particle physicists uh, who got much more money. In the meantime, it's not. Particle physics is also over the peak. Uh, so in the meantime, a little bit more justice is re-emerging. In the long run, there has to be justice in this world. Anyhow. So for, uh, further, it's of course, the heart of nuclear physics at the main ingredient. So, uh, uh, too. And then an, another uh, quote I want to give you that gives you an idea uh, what a huge uh, question it was, huge fundamental question it was in the last century to investigate the nature of nuclear force is a quote by Hans Bethe, who is really the father of nuclear physics in the United States and in Germany. Uh, <coughs> and he said, and he said that already in September 1950, which is uh, how long is that ago? That 60, <coughs> 60 years ago. He said, in the past quarter century, physicists have devoted uh, so in the past quarter century, physicists have devoted a huge amount of experimentation and mental labor to this problem of the nuclear force. Probably more man hours than have been given to any other scientific in the history of mankind. So he says already in 1953, uh, more work went into the theory, developing a theory of nuclear forces than in any other question in the history of mankind, which is the past 2,500 years. Uh, but this 53, and in, in the meantime, another 60 years, went by in which much, much more work went in than at that time. And so that gives you uh, an idea of the, of the enormous uh, <coughs> dimension of work that went into this question. Uh, and now some of this mental labor, <coughs> the, the first guy who did some mental labor on this question was Heisenberg in 1932. So Heisenberg was fast and efficient, and he was also ambitious. Uh, he, uh, in 1932, just the, the neutron was discovered. That means only then and only then it was clear there's a nuclear force. And a few months later, he comes already out with, with the attempt of a theory. Here I show him. This is Heisenberg, pretty much 
uh, as he was at, in the year 1932. Heisenberg was born in 1901, so 31. Uh, Pauli in 1900, so these guys are the same age, students were students together with uh, Sommerfeld. Uh, so if I show you Heisenberg's favorite company in the 1930s with Pauli and Niels Bohr. At least in those days, that was a favorite company, as you know, from the play Copenhagen. Then in the 40s, unfortunately, that changed very much. In any case, he published uh, the first paper on the theory of nuclear force in 1932. He published in a Zeitschrift für Physik, and this is the paper. And please feel free to read it. So <laughs> it's a cultural, there's an interesting remark here in place. So this, this paper is written in German. And it was published. It, many people read it. They had no other choice. And that shows uh, that, that certainly the, the language has changed a lot in, in communication and physics. If, if today, I, I'm German, if today I would do that, I could well throw the paper in the garbage. I mean, nobody would ever read that. So uh, it, it, uh, in those days, uh, as a scientist, you were kind of forced to know some job. Now, what, what is he saying? And the point of the matter is he, in, on page two of his paper, he says something very interesting uh, that for historical reasons, I, I want to let you know, because it's very unknown. Even experts on the theory of nuclear forces don't know that. He says the following. So I translated for you what I underline here. Uh, he says the following. So the force bit, he talks about the force between neutron and proton. And he says this is to be seen in analogy to the H2 plus ion. That means two protons and just one electron uh, uh, being exchanged with them, and ex which is an exchange of negative charge. So he, he says the, the neutron and proton interaction is an analogy to this. Uh, H2 plus item where the exchange of a negative charge, the electron, takes place. And then he says, now comes, this exchange can be visualized by electrons which do not have spin and follow the rules of Bose's statistics. So what he says actually here, the following, when you translate that into, into modern terminology, uh, this is the, the exchange of a pi plus uh, pi on. Yeah, of, of a pi, uh, the pi minus pi on. Yeah, he, he says a boson without spin. That, that's a meson. Uh, so he, he actually, in this paper, already suggests particle exchange, but then he, he kind of uh, blew it up because then he continues and says, but let's not go further into this and just take uh, this exchange integral as you, would, uh, as you do it for chemical binding and, and, and just work with that. So he was very close in his paper, very close to suggesting a meson exchange for uh, the exchange of the nuclear force. But he didn't follow through. The guy who followed through was Yukawa. Here's Yukawa, also in his favorite com uh, company. I show him his favorite company with Tomonaga and, and Sakata. And in fact, the, the funny thing is, uh, uh, these are his, his best friends all his life. And these three guys graduated from high school together at the same time. And two guys got a Nobel Prize, Tomonaga and, and Sakata got almost the Nobel Prize. So imagine you graduated from high school and then th three, three get almost the Nobel Prize. That's quite something. Uh, Tomonaga got it, uh, as most of you know, for renormalization with Feynman Schwinger. Sakata, the younger people from, of you uh, probably never heard of Sakata. It uh, doesn't mean he sucks and didn't do anything. Uh, because he didn't get a Nobel Prize. Uh, and no, he, he uh, did something, uh, something pretty good. And uh, for us, one should know it. Namely, he, for the first time, suggested that all the, and, and he did that already in the 50s, so really very early, very far-sighted, that all the elementary particles, even though there weren't, there weren't that many in the 50s, but enough to get thoughtful, uh, cannot be really elementary. And he already uh, developed the idea that only a few of them are elementary, and the other ones are a combination of the few. And for the few that are elementary, he suggested is the proton, the neutron, and the lambda. And then for the pion would, would be a proton uh, n bar, that would be a pi plus, and so on and so on. So he suggested that, that three, three, three uh, uh, Elementary particles, 
And in fact, interesting enough, these three particles have the same flavors as the three quarks up down strange. And so he suggested really a precursor of, of, the, of the quark model. And without that, probably Gellman later on would not have had, be able to develop that. The problem with this model it also propose, uh, it's also predicted a few things that, that didn't exist. Uh, but it was certainly a, a very crucial first step. And when Gellman got the Nobel Prize in 69, then actually Yukawa said that Sakata should also get him gotten part of that Nobel Prize. But in any case, to come back to Yukawa, who uh, is a man of uh, good company, but he is also a man of good ideas. Here's his, his paper. And his paper is very simple. It could have been just a homework problem, nowadays homework problem, for a first year graduate student, or well, not even graduate student, for a, a senior, junior, or senior. And he says, take the field equation for the photon which has the solution 1 over r, that's the Coulomb potential, and now just throw in a mass term, this lambda squared term, and then you get a solution uh, which is the Coulomb potential with the factor e to the minus kr, which makes the potential finite range, because that was the whole point. You, you notice we need for the nuclear force a, a, a force of finite range. So how, how, how do we get it finite range? And you notice when you give the uh, quantum that, uh, that creates a force, a mass, then you get this finite range. That was his essential uh, idea. And he, he was even more precise. This is his manuscript. In those days, a manuscript was, as the word manuscript says, written by hand and not written by Microsoft Word or something. Uh, and he says the following. He uh, even estimates how big the mass uh, should be of that particle. And he says, the, so we obtained for the mass of the here mu, the mass of this meson, uh, 200 times as large as an electron mass. Now, electron mass is half a MeV times 200 is 100 MeV. So he estimates it, that this particle that wasn't discovered at that time, it's a, a pure prediction, is about 100 MeV. And the particle that later on was found, as you know, the pion is, had 140. So it's a terrific estimate in 1935. So to summarize the early developments, so Chadwick discovers the neutron, Heisenberg does first phenomenology but misses a certain point, but he induces, by the way, the isosphere form formalism already, and you cover the Mason hypothesis. And in the 40s, the pion was found in cosmic ray and in the, in the, in the, in the in cyclotron in Berkeley, and so you cover got the Nobel Prize for his predictions. And then came the 1950s, and in the 1950s, an uh, interesting development went to place. Namely, uh, the obvious thing was now to say, OK, we found now the quantum, or the elementary particle, that makes the nuclear force. Now let's sit down and cal calculate this process of, of meson exchange with the, with, the, with the means of quantum field theory. And, uh, and see if, if you get it accurate. That, that has become known as a pion theories of the 1950s. And it's it turned out that the one pion exchange was OK, did very well, particularly for the Duron. Uh, but multi pion exchange turned out a disaster. And the, the, the reason for the disaster was these so called Z diagrams. Once you do a proper theory, you have to include also always the anti pion particles. So here you have nuclear and anti-nuclear intermediate states in the two pion exchange. The dashed lines are pions, the solid lines are nucleons and anti-nucleons. And these diagrams were huge, also in pion scattering. They were a factor of, of 100 too big. And uh, therefore, this whole problem, and one didn't know why. Yeah, one, one noticed these diagrams are, are, are junk. Uh, they should be, shouldn't be there or should be thrown out. But, but we didn't know why. And that's how the 50s ended with but in, in a disaster, because uh, there was no resolution. Now it came the 1960s, and what saved the situation temporarily is one found more mesons, besides the pion, heavier mesons. And these heavier mesons are all meson resonances. The sigma is a two pion exchange resonance, the row two, the row three pion. And that suggested the following, even though it's clear, it's, it's not, not a solution on uh, fundamental ground suggested that, okay, we had in the 50s a problem with multi-pion exchange, 
maybe nature, when it exchanges more than uh, uh, two parents and more, they stick together and resonances, and that's how, uh, how multiparent exchange uh, comes about. And when you do that, you get actually an excellent description of, uh, of the nuclear force. The 1960s, the model developed, known as one was an exchange model, is, was that instead of just exchanging the pion, just exchange the whole Greek alphabet of mesons, and then you get a beautiful force. And this is still today a great model for the nuclear force. Uh, however, the difference is in the early 60s, when it was developed, was perceived as fundamental. Yeah, the, the, the mesons and the nucleons were still seen as fundamental particles, <coughs> and it was seen as, as really a, a, a proper field theoretical model. Uh, that, that cannot be maintained today for reasons that become clear in a moment. Uh, but on the other hand, in, 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 in physics, uh, the, the, the only uh, interesting solution are not only the ones which are based on fundamental grounds. We do in physics a lot of modeling and a lot of phenomenology, and there's nothing wrong with that. And this uh, model for the nuclear force is still the most beautiful phenomenology and is actually more quantitative than, than any other approaches. And potentials of this kind are still today daily in, in use. However, History goes on, and ultimately in, in physics we, we have to, well, in physics we have to do always two things. We, we need a practical, a sol practical solution, workable solution, practical phenomenologies, and so on. That's fine. But there's also the other side to physics. After all, physics is not nuclear engineering. We also need ultimately uh, the explanation of everything on fundamental grounds. And in this sense, uh, <coughs> while the nuclear physicists are still very, very busy with their, with their beloved mesons, uh, new developments in, in the 1960s, namely, Spike suggested that nucleons are made from three quarks. So, Gelman and Spike actually at the same time uh, came up with that idea. And, well, actually, uh, as a historical uh, footnote, uh, actually, only one of them received the Nobel Prize for that, and you may guess who uh, did not get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, that changed the picture, if, if you take it literally. Namely, in, instead of this model for the nucleus, now this should be the model for the nucleus. Namely, every, every nucleon is to be replaced by three quarks. And uh, first of all, in the 70s, then also did between quarks was developed. The Gelman and Spike model was first just uh, group theory. Uh, they didn't think about the dynamics. It took a while to develop that. The, uh, well, there were many players in this game to develop the, the force between uh, quarks, but uh, Gross, uh, Pulitzer, and Wilczek were, were one of them who received the Nobel Prize in 2004. And they developed the interaction between, between quarks via gluon exchange. And so what that means now, to come back to this uh, seemingly modern picture of the nucleus, that meant that now, so let's take a really close look what's going on, uh, that the strong force, the fundamental strong force, now takes place between uh, quarks due to these, these uh, springs, and uh, which confine them in, into uh, colorless objects. And, and now this, this was, a, was a very fundamental point in history because it brought about a, a very fundamental change in the concept for the nuclear force, which caused enormous problems, which took a long time to overcome. Namely, up to 1970s, up to 1970s, the term nuclear force and strong force were considered identical. Yeah, the nuclear force was a strong force or a strong force was a nuclear force. Now you had to separate it. The, the strong force is a force between quarks. And the nuclear force is a different force. And what force is it? It is the, the residual force. Uh, there it is. The residual force between these confined 
uh, these objects confined through the, the pure strong force. And th that means suddenly, I mean, before we, we, we considered the nuclear force as a force where we have a direct mechanism, now suddenly it's demoted to some, some crappy, I mean, a residual force is kind of a, a, a small, dirty leftover of, of a big story. That's a residual force. And suddenly the nuclear force was demoted to that. Uh, 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 but apart from the fact that it's uh, kind of uh, uh, quite, of, quite offensive, which is not really an aspect here for the force, uh, it also means it gets very complicated. I mean, a residual force left over of a big pile of junk uh, is, is something very complicated to calculate. And that, that uh, is what one has to face now. Uh, it uh, also raises an analogy to make the point even more clear. Let me elaborate here on an analogy. Uh, it is the nuclear force is now uh, analogous to the Van der Waals force between uh, atoms. So uh, two neutral atoms, uh, uh, even though in zero approximation should have no force, they do have a force. And the analogy is to the nuclear force is uh, in the case of nucleons, you have also something neutral, but neutral with regard to charge, uh, to, to color charge. Yeah? Uh, 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 quarks uh, carry charge, color charge, and uh, also the, uh, uh, the, the objects you observe in nature are, are color neutral. And so uh, there's a beautiful analogy. So Van der Waals force is a force between electric charge, neutral objects, Nuclear force is the residual force between color charge, uh, color charge, uh, <coughs> neutral object. Uh, and once there is this analogy, you, of course, you are tempted to say, well, let's uh, challenge this analogy and uh, see how far it goes. Uh, so let's see how far it goes. Uh, then in the case of the Van Avance force, where, where does this residual force come from, it comes from two photon exchange, or dipole-dipole interaction. The dipole-dipole interaction and two photon exchange is essentially the same thing. Now, if that analogy was perfect, then the nuclear force should now be based upon two gluon exchange. But that analogy does not work for two reasons. First, gluons have no mass. That means if it's, if it's based on uh, gluon exchange, then the nuclear force should have infinite range, which is not, not the case. Secondly, uh, uh, gluons carry color, and uh, colored objects uh, are confined. Talking about the analogy between the force and the nuclear force, this analogy is uh, So, two gluon exchange is not the solution. And so, the question is what's going on between, uh, uh, just for the two nuclear force, you have a mass of six quarks, and what's going on there? And uh, three, essentially three options have been tried to get out of this dilemma. One is to build uh, quark models. And in fact, you have a member here of your institute, Bruno, who has worked uh, on, on this. Uh, but uh, I hope Bruno isn't angry when I say that. Uh, they, I mean, they give, give some insight of what's going on, but ultimately they, they are a model and, and not a fundamental solution. It's not the, the ultimate solution. Uh, the uh, more exact solution is uh, when, you, when you have this problem that doesn't have ana any analytic solution, uh, to do it with brute uh, numerical force, and that's known as lattice QCD. Also, you have a member here who is expert on that. That's Professor Zumta Parenjo, who is a member of a big international co collaboration on that. So, uh, in fact, you have experts here on everything. And, uh, but that is, again, uh, lattice scarcity is important to at least uh, try to solve a few representative cases as, as good as possible. For instance, the, just the two nucleon case and maybe the three nucleon case. But it cannot be the, the, the standard method to, to calcul calculate, say, carbon 12 or oxygen 40 because you just have too many particles. And so uh, the question is, what do we do? And uh, the, the solution, not the solution, but one suggestion that has been made by, is to take another, another look at the problem in, you know, uh, under a different aspect or 
taking a, a slightly different view when looking at the problem, and this is Weinberg, he has stated something that sometimes is quoted as a folk theorem that sounds very disrespectful, but Weinberg himself uh, called his uh, statement here a folk theorem, and then, uh, well, then that's okay to say that. Uh, and he said the following, and that pretty much uh, summarized the whole spirit of this attempt to solve the, the problem of, of a quark-based nuclear force. Namely, if one writes down the most general possible Lagrangian, including all terms consistent with assumed symmetry principles, and then calculates matrix elements with Lagrangian to give an order, the result will be simply the most general possible S matrix consistent with blah, 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 in particular the assumed symmetry principles. So to put, to put this, uh, to say this even uh, more sh short and concise is if you <coughs> consider a system in physics and you know the symmetries the, that's underlying the systems and the reactions going on in the system, then you write down the Lagrangian that contains all terms consistent with the symmetry and you do calculations with Lagrangian, you will get the most general result consistent with those symmetries. And what is silent here also implied by this, even though it's not stated here explicitly in this theorem, so important is that, you, uh, that your Lagrangian has all terms with the symmetries that you want to observe. What de however, what degree of freedom you take that's up to you, and that depends on the scale on which you work. At a different scale, different degrees of freedom are relevant, and that, that you should choose according to your scale. But as long as you uh, follow this, this rule here, you will get on, get on every scale in which you work the appropriate, most general result. And that's essentially uh, the, the basis of something that has become known as an effective field theory. And now, in the case of the nuclear force, uh, the most important uh, symmetry, I mean, there's, of course, symmetry like Lorentz uh, invariance and so on, but that's all trivial. Uh, any theory should have that anyhow, so there's nothing special to this problem. But special to this problem is chiral symmetry to the nuclear force problem. And uh, the, I first explained what chirality is chirality is handedness, so you, you, you have to combine a spin and momentum of a particle, and you can align them, then that's, you can identify with the right hand, or you can have them point in opposite direction, that's then similar to a left hand. And the, the point of the matter is when a particle has zero mass, then the chirality, then the particle can never change its chirality, and so chirality is conserved, or you have chiral symmetry. And as it turns out, the up and down quarks, essentially normal nuclear physics, not strange nuclear physics, that's a little bit different. But I'm talking here essentially about non-strange, so standard nuclear physics is essentially up-down physics, up-down quark physics. And they have very, very small masses, just a few EV, on a scale to be seen, I mean, everything is relative in life. The, the, the scale on, on which you should see it is one GV, a scale of one GV, uh, 3 MeV is, is very little, almost zero. And so they have approximate chiral symmetry. And so the, the conclusion is QCD in the, the up-down quark setter has approximate chiral symmetry. And that is the most important symmetry that you should observe. And thus, we arrive at an effective field theory for low energy QCD, which is characterized by degrees of freedom that you choose relevant to low energy nuclear physics, which are and nucleons. So again, uh, you, uh, uh, that's what I just meant by saying uh, you, you need to know on what scale you are working, and then you choose the degrees of uh, freedom that are relevant on that scale. In nuclear, in low, I'm talking about low energy in nuclear physics. Uh, what you see are nucleons and maybe pions, but you don't see quarks and gluons. So quarks and gluons are ineffective degrees of free freedom, and so you choose uh, nuclear pions as an effective one. It is a different story when you do nuclear physics on what is known in nuclear physics, nuclear physics as, as RIC physics, relativistic high and heavy iron physics of several harmony GeV, where you see a quark gluon plasma, and of course quarks and gluons are the right degrees of freedom, but that's not, uh, not the case in standard nuclear physics where I'm referring to. Then 
you, you make in this effective field theory, you make the connection to the QCD via, via the characteristic symmetries, chiral symmetries, and their breakings. Actually, there's another point here to chiral symmetry that's almost, sounds almost like a contradiction. Uh, chiral symmetry is spontaneously broken. And this spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry is almost more important than the chiral symmetry itself because this spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry of, of generating the pion. Uh, there's a, a theory known uh, from Goldstone that whenever a symmetry is spontaneously broken, it generates a, a particle that is theoretically massless or has a very small mass. So the pion has a very small mass, and that's generated by the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry. And so the, the symmetry and its breaking regenerates the pion. So this is a pion is in business, but for completely different reasons as uh, the theoretical attempts of the 1950s. Another more characteristic for every effective field theory is that it is, uh, you do an order by order expansion and uh, you have to make sure a theory doesn't fail that, that uh, when you go through the concept of the effective field theory, uh, which uh, was I just the uh, quick uh, um, uh, that that uh, D, that the amp to type the nuclear force on the base QCD has generated e effective field theory approach out of this dilemma is what is here stated in the slide. Okay, and what that means, remember this was the last picture of the nucleus. That means we go now back again to protons and neutrons. We go back and to so that, that is the and and again we, we deal with pions. And now remember what I said uh, in the 1950s, as, in other words, we are suddenly back again to a theory with pion. And that uh, rings a bell because that was uh, what was tried in the 1950s and it, it failed. And now, come, and now does it fail again or fail, does it not fail? It doesn't fail because you remember the, the diagrams that spoiled everything were these new on intermediate grimes, and when you impose chiral symmetry, but now the thing is, one has learned something. One has learned something from low energy QCD, that namely the, the pions, you cannot just let them do whatever they want. Their interaction needs to be constrained by chiral symmetry, because chiral symmetry is a characteristic of low energy QCD. And when you then use only pion nuclear energy, that are constrained by chiral symmetry, then these guys come out small or negligible. And, and, and so that, that is a big progress that we had made. And that progress could only be made by making this loop through QCD. And that's one of the things. And then once all these rules are in place, then the nuclear force, to make a long story short now, then the nuclear force emerges order by order. So every line here is an order. And in every order, you have a characteristic a bunch of diagrams, a dot, a dash, and there are only dashed lines, solid lines, nucleons. So you have only pion exchanges, but you have, it, you have one pion exchange, multi pion exchange, and, and all this. And so once the, the effective field theory rules are in place, uh, the essentially the, the, uh, the, the whole uh, nuclear force in the concept of effective field theory all develops by itself. Yeah, I'm standing here, hands up, and the whole thing comes down by itself. Uh, and then the question, <coughs> and an interesting byproduct is the following. Uh, in, pr in principle, you can have forces not only between two neutrons, also between three and four. And in this effective field theory approach, three nuclear forces are generated automatically, and four nuclear also. And another thing is 
Uh, the purpose of, of this hierarchy is always, at, at least as a rule of thumb, what's on top is large and then gets smaller and smaller, even though it goes a little in practice. Nothing is perfect, goes a little bit weakly, but in principle, that's the way it goes. And it occurs late. Yeah, this occurs late. It has to be small, higher order. And so what this effective field theory then also automatically predicts is that three-body three forces are much weaker than two-body forces. And then models have been developed based on, on this effective field theory approach. And there are thousands of data, so let me not show observables. Show, let me show you already the chi-square per datum for the refraction of the thousands of data, for instance, between 0 and 290 MeV uh, nuclear energy. We have 2,400 NP data. And uh, when you do effective field theory at very low order, you, you get a chi-square per, per datum of 86, which is pretty awful, but then the next order is much better, and finally you get almost a perfect uh, chi-square of about one. So the, the chi-square development is essentially, <coughs> first it's 100, the order of 100, then 10, and then 1. So great rate of convergence. So the effective field theory works in this, in, in this regard. And now uh, let me turn to the, the other half of the story, but let me be brief there because uh, the time is progressing, is uh, what we have now achieved, we have a manageable, we have developed a manageable theory of nuclear forces that has a, a, a firm relationship to QCD. Now, now what? That uh, the purpose of theory is twofold. It has an intrinsic value. It means a value by itself, a lot for a lot. Uh, so it is a delightful thing by itself. Uh, theory has also a uh, extrinsic value, and uh, that means you, you should use it, you should apply it. And what would that be? Well, you, you should calculate now atomic nuclei and see if you get them right. And uh, it's easy. Okay, then how well do we understand the structure of the known atomic nuclei with these forces? Hmm. Uh, now, it's easy to say. To find out isn't easy because there are very many nuclei. Yeah, this is a chart. The chart is meant here on the horizontal axis. We have the number of neutrons uh, on the vertical axis, the number of protons. And each square is a whole nucleus. For instance, there's a little black square here that says 126 neutrons, 82 uh, protons. So this little square stands for lead. And uh, so all the black squares are stable nuclei. Then the ones are instable ones, and the is uh, not yet explored, but believed to be true and needs to be explored. So this is pretty much the program uh, of nuclear physics for the future that has started already and on which we have made a great progress. The progress underway, we have we used different many-body methods, this is a many-body problem, for different numbers of uh, nuclei. And uh, we proceed systematically, yeah, that's how we start with two nucleons. Well, that's what I talked about in the first half of my talk, the two nucleon force. Then comes three nucleons and so on. And two nucleon problems are easy in physics. Actually, they're not that easy in physics, as the first half of my talk showed, but relatively easy as compared to other things. And, uh, well, two problems are easy in physics and in human life, yep. Well, actually, actually, what I just said wasn't that easy. That also applies, of course, to this. Everybody who is married uh, to a certain degree with me. Uh, uh, but three-body problems, then there are three-body problems. They are difficult in human life because this is even more difficult. So, then, uh, so everything is relative, yeah? And uh, they are also difficult in physics. For instance, the three-body problem in physics is approached with Fadeev equations, and uh, I won't go through it, but this impression will give you already the impression that, oh, that it isn't, isn't too easy. The only, only difference between human life is uh, you have to solve this problem. It's an even more difficult one, while the, the three-body problem in human life is something you better stay away from it. So which is a different story. Just to give you a little bit of taste of uh, what, what other problems there are in, in nuclear structure, 
is I show you some results which are just from three body reactions. And they have been calculated using two body forces that, that are the blue curves. So here's some data, deuteron proton scattering at 135 MeV. Uh, you get the blue curve <coughs> for, for low angles agrees, but then for higher angles there's definitely a disagreement similar here. And uh, then when you add the three body force, you get it much better. The same happens here. And so this, uh, as a sample, as a symbolic sample, uh, uh, should serve to explain to you that in nuclear physics, three body forces are important. Yeah, with the two body force alone, you, you are not getting, uh, getting anywhere. And the Kyle effective field theory does predict three body forces that go in, into into the right direction. Uh, and these are these three body forces that were included in those calculations that then lead to a, a, a great improvement. Uh, but let me make here another historical remark. What most people don't know is that many biophysical are actually idea. Most people think that only since 2000, uh, three body forces are a big issue in nuclear physics. Uh, that is not true. As early, here's a historical paper from 1939 by Prima Koff and Holstein, and the title is Many Body Interaction in Atomic and Nuclear Physics. So in 1939, already Prima Koff and Holstein have calculated the three body forces that, based on field theory, the three body forces that can occur in atomic physics process, and then they have calculated uh, analogous three body forces in, in nuclear physics, and at that time, already Mason theory, even though Mason theory was, was just a, a, a theory, a hypothesis. And they come already here to the conclusion that in atomic physics, there are definitely three body forces are definitely negligible. There are three body forces. You can write diagrams down easily, but they are absolutely tiny and negligible. While in, they predict already that in nuclear physics, three body forces can potentially be as large as two body forces. And qualitatively, they're, they're right. On the other hand, this paper was forgotten for many, many years, particularly, I think, because it's very difficult to include three body forces. Uh, but now, uh, 40 years, 60 years later, uh, actually, that can all be confirmed. In any case, uh, uh, time, time is almost up. Uh, this second part of nuclear physics, where you have now, with the forces, uh, you have to calculate uh, nuclei with increasing number of nucleons is essentially attacked in the following way. You are, you are confronted here with a quantum mechanical many body problem. And how you solve the quantum mechanical many body problem depends on how many nucleons you have. For smaller numbers, you can do more exact calculations. For intermediate numbers, you have to use other methods. And so, and that is one of the big progresses that for the last 10 years, that the appropriate many body methods for the uh, different uh, typical numbers of nucleons have been refined and, and further developed, and more and more precise results come out. And uh, for instance, uh, there is a method known as a no core shell model. And let me sh <coughs> typically show what people calculate just as a sample is uh, this is boron 10. It has a ground state and excited state. And when you use only two body forces, you get this, which doesn't match this very well. When you add three body forces, you get this. At least the ground state comes out right, and the rest comes out better. There is room for improvement, but there is already a great progress as to uh, what one adds. Then one can calculate nowadays uh, uh, the processes of, nu of uh, nucleosynthesis. Uh, uh, relevant for astrophysics, one can calculate uh, the process of deuterium tritium uh, fusion, which is important for energy <coughs> research. At the, at the Livermore National Lab, they do this experimentally as well. The theory group provides theoretical support and is calculating this process. There are also intermediate nuclei have been calculated here, for instance. I show you, let's go to the right picture, the calcium isotopes of a wide range of neutron numbers. And again, the black line are the experimental values. The blue line is when you use only Kyle two-body forces. 
the red line which overlaps very, very well with the black line with the, with the experiment is obtained when you include three body forces. So, a great successes uh, up to intermediate heavy nuclei. And finally, of course, you get into a region of very large neutron numbers. Then, uh, approach is taken known as density functional theory, what essentially means uh, if for smaller nuclear numbers you assume a grainy nucleus, then in density functional theory you dissolve that to, uh, uh, to densities and then integrate over, over the functional. And so, in summary, uh, for the whole periodic table, many body methods for any number of nucleons have been developed are being improved. The successful explanation of nuclei of any kind and their reaction is rapidly progressing. So that's one of the great successes of the last 10 years. And so let me summarize now the whole thing I talked about. Uh, we, we do now, uh, we, we are positioned the first time in the history of uh, nuclear physics to do a consistent bottom-up approach. That means we, we start from QCD, start here, the nucleons condense, uh, the, the quarks condense to nucleons, then from where we uh, derive the bare nuclear nuclear interaction, and then we calculate nuclei uh, by solving few and many body problems. So, this approach we take, or in words, this approach we take. So, we, we, we start from quantum chromodynamics for then consistent with that and effectively from there the interaction, from there up initial calculation, then more indirect shell model calculation and density. And for the first time, we can consistently do this, uh, go through this scheme. That means we are now approaching the of nuclear physics is how does nuclear physics emerge from QCD, from QCD, I mean, nuclear physics, strong interaction physics, and the fundamental theory of strong interaction is, is QCD. And so, the, the, the most fundamental question you have to face is how does nuclear physics, and the nuclei as we know them, emerge from QCD? And these arrows indicate how, how that goes. And, but one can also tell the story in more colorful pictures, more colorful pictures in nuclear physics reaches from the most fundamental part of particle physics represented by the most famous physicist of the last century, namely all these guys that I showed introduced to you. Through, furthermore, through the history of the universe, from the beginning, the world of today, where in particular a primordial nucleosynthesis and stellar uh, nuclear synthesis are hot topics on which we are making more progress. All the way down, go, and nuclear physics continues, and all the way down, the down to earth applications, radioactive dating, nuclear energy, uh, nuclear medicine, magnetic resonance imaging, and much, much more. And that we have now progress in all these fields and continue rapidly. That is the status of nuclear physics today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I, I would like to say that at 3.30, in principle, Professor Maglite can meet with the students and postdocs who may be interested in the Aula Pere Pascual. So now, if any questions from the audience, please. So, uh, the, the ones, uh, you mentioned that uh, the good ones are masters, uh, but uh, we know that uh, well, the good ones don't have a physical soul there, but they have some kind of uh, energy scale, and we know from the lab, for instance, that you can have blue balls and uh, some kind of system that are not state, for instance. Is there any way in, in what you have been talking about that? These kind of objects can appear or uh, yeah. relevant? Blue boards would not be colorless, yeah, otherwise we would. Yes. And there is traditionally in the Mason theory of nuclear forces, you need a scalar boson that is known as a sigma boson. 
And the nature of the sigma boson has always been controversial. Uh, it could be a pi pi resonance, but there isn't really a very well. It's controversial if there is a real pi pi S wave resonance, etc., etc. And the possibility is that the sigma is a glue ball. And uh, so there, there is a remote possibility uh, uh, of, of what to indicate. And the only problem is that the, uh, the sigma, if it wants to be useful to describe the nuclear forces, has to have about the right mass because it has to represent equivalent to a certain range. And that mass is around 500, 600 MeV. To my understanding that all predictions uh, of blue balls are unfortunately in the moment much higher. They are more like 1,600, in which case it wouldn't be quite consistent with the range. Uh, but in principle, what you raise is, is a, a good and interesting aspect. And the final word is not spoken yet. You need more let us more, more precise let us calculate. Okay, so my question was that uh, there is a discrepancy Well, uh, I, I guess this is not 100% understood, and therefore I can also not, not offer uh, an explanation. It could be accidental, or it could be, could be some uh, underlying uh, connection, but uh, at this time it's, it's really hard to say uh, what it is. So I, I have no plausible explanation for that. Or, at this point, I cannot draw any, any say, very lightening conclusion from this, uh, from this process of the variables. But it's something to think about. I have one question in your progress when you say, for instance, you go always through these effective theories of nuclear nuclear interactions. The prospect of really using QCD, like people are doing lattice QCD, to understand low nuclei, low lying nuclei, is this reasonable or it really makes no sense because you are using the wrong degrees of freedom somehow? No, uh, it is okay because uh, the, you can, what you can always do, as even if you believe, say, certain degrees of freedom are the adequate one. You can always de, uh, make your life, life so, so to speak, harder and say, no, I, I, I go down to more fundamental degrees of freedom. And when you do, however, when you do this calculation right with the more fundamental degrees of freedom and have enough computing time and went through all the pain because it, it will be much more painful, you should come up with a similar result, okay. except it's more any other questions comments no if not let's remind me that at 3 30 he's meeting a student so if anybody is interested and postdocs also please come here and i'll try to write it down and let's finalize and thank again professor maglite and thank you for your attention <laughs>